Welcome back to the USCA AC National Championships held in September of 2022. Your tournament director is Jeff Su, who's come closer than anybody to perfecting the art of directing and playing well in a tournament at the same time. He doesn't have his wife Eileen's help this time, though, so let's see how he does. We are now the official YouTube channel of our major sponsor, the United States Croquet Association. You can find everything you want to know about croquet at the USCA, from rules to rosters to how to join, you name it. It gives me great pleasure to acknowledge Chris Barley's generous sponsorship, which allowed us to do more games at this tournament. He would ordinarily be here, but he's off being worldly in the UK this week. You're looking at the two major lawns at the Chesapeake Bay Croquet Club. The bottom is the newer one, which will have 16 courts. The top is the established eight courts that we're going to play on this time. The total of 24 courts will allow world championships, expanded nationals, etc. Tournament manager is club member Lyle Browning, with the assistance of all the volunteers that make this kind of thing possible. This is a Game 3 tiebreaker in a semifinal match between Matthew Essek, the top-ranked player in the U.S. and fourth in the world. He won this two years ago. Jeff Sue, your tournament director, is the defending champion. Zach Watson is second-ranked in the U.S. at the end of this tournament, and he joins Matthew on the McRobertson Shield team next month. They're going to be playing on court six. This shot was taken early in the morning. The game we're about to see is it midday and this game is a first for this youtube channel i'm going to call this a director's cut because these guys walk so fast and play so well that there was no need for me to edit anything out so this video is completely unexpurgated you do have to listen to me blather on but you can turn the sound down if you don't want to do that so Zach uses one of the two standard responses to Matthew's super shot. The other is just outside corner two, of course. These two are on the McRobertson Shield team, along with Ben Rothman, Jeff Sue, Stephen Morgan, and Tom Balding. And they play in November. Tactically, a miss from the end of a balk here gives Matthew a rush into corner four. So that if Zach should miss from corner three into corner four, he might be able to get a corner four cannon going on turn five. Looks like hoop four is in the way of giving Zach any kind of double, so he's going to go up to B-Bonk and try to make one.
He's going to try to put red right behind yellow so he can do a mid boundary three ball cannon. From Australia, Wayne Davies' compilation of John Ritchie's writings has the most extensive description of all the possible cannons in AC. You can get it on Amazon, but be forewarned, it's over 700 pages, and some of it will put you to sleep. The purpose of a cannon, of course, is to generate a three or four ball break in one stroke. Corner one and corner four, the most common. Here, he's getting four at one blow. I'm grasping for something to comment on here, but I've seen Robert Fletcher in this situation rush red over a lot closer to yellow to guarantee getting a good rush on yellow to hoop too. He would have put red right back where Matthew's leaving it anyway. But Matthew's not afraid of the takeoff because yellow's close enough to hoop two that making hoop two off yellow won't be a problem. Matthew's gotten attention from everybody about this because he switches between Irish and Solomon a lot. I asked him about it, and he's pretty rational about this process. He uses Irish for almost all the touch shots, and Solomon when he needs more pace. So these last three or four shots were all Irish, but here, because he wants to send Blue a little farther, he's going to use Solomon. 
We'll talk about this again when he gets the two back on one of these breaks because he occasionally will use Solomon um, for a controlled hoop shot as well. And of course the reason he uses Solomon for the shots that need more pace is that if you can hit it harder without any extra effort, then your accuracy is preserved. And that's what Solomon lets you do because the backswing is so free. He was putting red on the east side of hoop four like that initially surprised me. But you'll see, I think he's just giving himself room to work around hoop five. Most of the top players like to do what he's doing is double load hoop five one way or another and then drop off partner as a two back pioneer before you make six. In his case, I think it's important because he prefers a new standard leave and you have to have both opponent balls down around six and one back to do that. You give up your four ball break for a couple of hoops doing this, but you place that two back pioneer from a much shorter distance. Matthew's going to try to set up a mom standard leave. It's a variation on the new standard leave, and it's been around for a long time, but David Mom was the first top player to use it almost exclusively. I don't know whether Matthew's ever talked to David Mom about it or not, but here's what he's trying to do. First, you've got to wire the opponent ball from the end of B bar. Second, you don't want the opponent ball rushable to hoop one because if they hit in, they're going to need that ball to make hoop one. Third, you don't want the opponent ball wired from corner four because if they miss into corner four from corner three and then you screw up hoop one, you don't want them to have a lift because your balls are sitting around hoop one. And lastly, it needs to be close to hoop two. All of this comes from Chris Clark, and you'll find it on the Clark Croquet website. Doing this leave requires a fair amount of precision, and the reason it's worth it is twofold. If they leave their ball that he's going to put at hoop four, then it's a little easier to get your triple going. And second, it can be a forcing leave. You put the ball at hoop two that they really want to play, then they have to leave you the hoop four ball, etc. I asked Matthew about this, and he said that if the opponent has already made nine, sometimes he's taking Ben Rothman's lead and popping opponent through hoop one and doing a more horizontal diagonal spread to make it harder for the opponent to do a triple if they hit in. That's basically the only time he does a diagonal, but we won't discuss that in detail until I actually get it on video.
What's going to happen next after he places yellow requires tremendous precision as well. I suggest you not try this at home. Because he didn't get what he wanted with red at hoop two, he's going to have to go fix it. But he has to come back to this position so that yellow is wired from blue and black on the east boundary. So he didn't get what he needed for the mom standard leave, as that graphic demonstrated. So he's going to bail out to a new standard leave. And had the ball at hoop four not fallen into place, he could have bailed out to an old standard leave. I think it's safe to say that this is world-class croquet you're watching. As Chris Clark says, you give your self the best chance to play well whilst minimizing the chance of something really bad happening if things don't go quite right. Something really bad happening means leaving Zach Watson a seven-yard shot. And Zach, of course, knows all too well this may be his last chance. So he's going to pick up the ball that Matthew wants him to leave because the triple's easier, and he's going to take the shortest possible shot because he knows he's going to lose if he doesn't hit. This is not a double for him. So he has to shoot at one of those balls specifically. And the only thing to wonder about is if he could have come over like the corner one and made it a double, but it would have been the same shot basically because it would have been twice as far away. This does make it easier for Matthew because now he can kick yellow out into position to use it later and get a rush on partner to hoop one. And if he makes hoop one on partner, it makes the triple easier because he can place the P. Lee at four back early.
He's taking the extra effort to fix this Pioneer, but I wonder if he would have bothered at all if this was just the first break to four back. I think he's doing this because he's trying to run a triple and he needs to be as precise as possible. Danny Honeycutt says to put the Peely two feet in front and one foot to the side of hoop three when you're doing the four back peel. Just about like that. Let's go. He wanted black a little closer to the hoop, but. As they say in England, he copes. It just occurred to me that since I can't get in or out of this position, I don't really know what he's looking at. I assume he's lining it up so that the Peely just misses the inside edge of the near wire. I would usually cut that out, but unexpurgated means you get warts and all. I said he's using Irish grip on almost all of his touch shots. He said over the phone the last few months he started to use Solomon for this really short hoop shot. One, if he wants control, and two, if he wants to make sure he goes to the boundary on even numbered hoops. We'll see that later.
spreads the escape ball after he peels black through Pinot. So he's hoping for a stop shot peel, it looks like. And, you know, he could do a positional peel of black through six here and make the hoop and then do the real peel through Pinot afterwards. There's no name for that. Probably because it has a high potential for a ruinous outcome and nobody wants their name attached to it. I go on about the benefits of dropping off the two-back Pioneer early after hoop five, the way Matthew did in his first break. But as David Malou suggests, it's quite feasible after hoop six as well. You would generally like to have the penal P. Lee go through a little bit further, but he manages. There he goes again, using Solomon for the short shots around the hoop. <laughs> Not only is this triple on time, but he's placed the yellow ball at three back well enough that he can get a transit peel out of it. And now he doesn't have to do a straight peel at Rover at the end of his turn.
It's no surprise that he's going to finish. This was an incredibly hard-fought match. Zach won the first one, 26 to 17. Matthew won the second with a TPO. And Brian was dying to get that one on video, but he couldn't get there. So we finally get to make Becky Essek, Matthew's grandmother, happy. And to her credit, she hasn't bugged me once for not doing this earlier in this series. So in the first unexpurgated director's cut, Matthew wins game three, takes the semifinal, and gets into the finals of the 2022 USCA AC National Championships. So thanks again to the USCA and to Chris Bodley for their sponsorship. Give us a like, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you see when the rest of the nationals gets posted.